If you want to know about the big secret that Eddie kept from his friends, then stick around to the end of this video. I'm pretty sure only one member of the Losers Club, the seven kids that battle it in the sewers of Derry, Maine, can say that he single-handedly saved all of his friends from certain death. And that honor belongs to Eddie Spaghetti Kasprak. But despite his heroics, Eddie is subject to a lot of psychological damage brought on by his past, only some of which is explored in the movie adaptations. My name is Professor Seezy's World, and today on Horror History, You Wanted to See It brings you one of the most exciting episodes it's ever been your privilege to click on. Okay kids, Seasons World is proud to present Derry Maine's very own Wheezy. Here I am, Wheezy. Edward Kasprak was born in 1946, the son of Frank Kasprak and his wife Sonia. In 1951, when Eddie was five years old, two events would take place that would change the course of his entire life. First, his father died of cancer. My dad, he died in the big C. The big C? Cancer. I was just a little kid. Then, Eddie himself nearly died when he got a particularly bad fever. His mother Sonia was likely grief-stricken at the prospect of nearly being left alone. She had lost one of her boys and was not going to lose the other, so she became obsessed with protecting Eddie's health, to the point where she develops a disorder known as factitious disorder, or when someone falsely claims that another person has symptoms of illness, injury, or disease with the intention of deceiving others. In other words, Sonia would invent medical conditions for Eddie in order to keep him out of anything that she perceived to be possibly dangerous, like gym class, or pretty much going outside. I want to be a train conductor and see the world. That is if your mom ever lets you cross the street. Eddie sees the first effects of the factitious disorder when his mother takes him to get new shoes for an upcoming wedding. After Mrs. K rejected many shoes for her son, he wandered off and discovered a machine. He didn't know what it was, but in reality, it was a shoe-fitting fluoroscope, an x-ray machine that they used to have in shoe stores instead of just using one of these things for some reason. When his mom noticed him using this machine, she flipped out and dashed towards him, making a scene in the store while screaming. Eddie, get off of there! She screamed. Get off of there! Those machines can give you cancer! Get off of there, Eddie! Eddie! The whole scene startled Eddie so much that he nearly fell off the fluoroscope, but his mom got there just in time to catch him, and from this point forward, she was so overprotective of him that he would never even get a minor injury for the next seven years. But she would not stop there. In 1954, when Eddie was eight, Sonia took him to the doctor, and despite Eddie saying he was fine, she pressured his physician, Dr. Handor, into prescribing him asthma medication. The aspirator that he got really just contained water vapor with a slight medicinal taste, but Eddie came to believe that he couldn't survive without it and became very reliant on it whenever he felt slightly uncomfortable. His mother got him on other medications as well, but the aspirator is something that Eddie would always have with him. Because of the way he was raised, Eddie becomes a hypochondriac, someone with an intense obsession about their health. It even gets to the point that Sonia starts to isolate her son from other children. In Eddie's fifth grade year, his mom screams at the PE teacher for letting him participate, claiming that he's too fragile to take part. No gym and no showers with the other boys this week. I don't want you catching their germs. Despite all of this, Eddie had an uncharacteristic fascination with building a soapbox racer. His dream was to build the fastest racer and take it to a competition in Ohio to win the grand prize. His mother actually allowed him to work on this project in the garage, with no intention of ever letting him take the vehicle out, thinking that he's never actually going to get that far. His interest in taking the wheel of a soapbox racer may have led to his eventual career as a limousine driver, and the eventual owner of his own limo company. But I think the biggest contributing factor was his impeccable sense of direction. When he and Bill Denbro first started playing in the Barrens, Eddie was always the one who helped them navigate back out on their own. In 1957, Eddie helped Bill tune up his bike Silver, but after the death of Bill's brother later that year, Eddie would also sometimes play alone near the little-traveled Kneebolt streets near the train yard. One day, in 1958, a drunken train man threw out a crate from the train and told Eddie to take it home to his mother. He did not open it, but he could tell it was filled with slithery, crawly things. He might have just left the box there if the train man hadn't mentioned his mother, but Eddie has this psychological weakness when it comes to his mom, so he obeys. After dragging the crate home, it Mrs. K is delighted to find that the crate is filled with lobster, but Eddie refused to eat them because he was constantly reminded of the clicking sound that they made. He probably would have strongly disliked Hereditary. <laughs> His fear of the lobsters may be related to his eventual demise. Lobsters are eaten by pulling off each of the parts, such as the claws and legs, and removing the meat from inside. When Eddie dies in 1985, the creature, in the form of a giant spider, pulls off his arm. That was also the last southern seacoast train that Eddie ever saw come through Derry, and it represents how he can never leave his mother, how he's trapped in her vice grip. You might even call it lobster-like. One day, Eddie was playing near the train yard again when a hobo crawled out from under the porch of an abandoned house at 29 Niebold Street. The hobo 
offered to do Eddie a favor for a quarter, and Eddie realizes the man has leprosy, which scares him and sends him running for his bike. Although Eddie was scared by the incident, he acquired a strange fascination with 29 Nebel Street and comes back to investigate it. He crawls under the porch and discovers a face staring back at him from the basement window. This thing resembled the hobo, but it was something else. The forehead was split open and covered in yellow mucus. The thing breaks open the window and comes after Eddie, wearing a silvery clown suit with big orange buttons. It introduces itself as Bob Gray, and as Eddie runs, it gained ground on him, and it told him to come back anytime and bring his friends too. Oh, come back anytime. Bring your friends. <laughs> He didn't look back until he was nearly home. One night, while Eddie was laying in bed, he heard the voice of the leper whisper in his ear, telling him it won't do any good to run. Stay tuned for more horror history. It was June of 1958 when the town's biggest bully, Henry Bowers, destroyed Bill and Eddie's dam in the Barrens while looking for Ben Hanscom, giving him a bloody nose and an asthma attack. Ben comes out of hiding to stay with Eddie while Bill runs to the drugstore to refill Eddie's aspirator. While he's gone, they discuss their own theories about the killer that's been taking kids in Derry, and Eddie tells Ben not to mention Bill's brother George, who was one of the victims. Ben is also covered in blood, and Eddie gives him the idea to buy a milkshake and spill half of it on himself so that his mother won't find out about the blood. The next time they meet up to build the dam, Eddie worries about his mother yelling at him for taking off his shoes in the stream and putting him at risk of getting a cold. Eddie is annoyed with his pal Richie Tozier because he doesn't like how Richie calls him Eds. In the miniseries, the unwanted nickname is Eddie Spaghetti. Don't do that. I hate it when you do that. And don't call me Eddie Spaghetti. Later that day, the Spaghetti Man shares his story about the leper encounter with the group, and they conclude that what each of them saw was connected. That afternoon, he helps the other boys clear up the dam after getting in trouble with the police officer, Mr. Nell. Eddie is not present when Richie Tozier organizes the outing to the Aladdin Theater because his mom was making him visit his fat, single aunts who lived in Haven, Bangor, and Hampton. But he was present the day that Beverly told him, Ben, and Bradley Donovan about the blood that she saw in her bathroom sink. They sneak in the back door so that Beverly's neighbor doesn't tell her father that she had boys over. And like Beverly, they're all able to see the blood that her parents could not, and offer to help her clean it up. The calendar rolls over to July, and Eddie and his friends are playing safari in the Barrens. As they cross the stream, they pretended that it was full of piranhas. He looked into the bright water, and for one moments, between the sun flashes that darted arrows of light into his eyes, he actually saw the cruising piranhas. They were not part of the make-believe that went with Bill's jungle safari fantasy. He was quite sure of that. The fish he saw looked like oversized goldfish, with great ugly jaws of catfish or groupers. Saw teeth protruded between their thick lips, and like goldfish, they were orange. As orange as the fluffy pom-poms you sometimes saw on the suits the clowns wore at the circus. This incident highlights the connection between the kids' imaginations and it. Their creativity is what makes them more delicious targets, which is why most of its victims are human children. But their imaginations are also their greatest weapon against it, and we see more of that later on in the summer. The kids tried to go to the dump, but were chased off by Mr. Fascio, and they ended up going to the gravel pits, where they meet up with Mike Hanlon and help him fend off the Bowers gang in a brutal rock fight. At the end of the battle, Eddie has an asthma attack and has to relieve himself using his aspirator. A few days later, on July 6th, the rain pushes one of Pennywise's victims, Jimmy Cullum, out into the sun, where Bill and Eddie pass within 40 yards of it, while bringing in boards for their clubhouse in the Barrens. Later that day, Mike shows the others his father's dairy photo album, and one of the pages comes to life because of it, and takes many forms to try to scare them, one of which is the leper that Eddie had seen at 29 Niebold. Later that month, after the group had attempted to perform the smoke hole ritual, Eddie went to the pharmacy to pick up medication for his mother and himself. It was July 20th, and on this occasion, the pharmacist, Mr. Keen, called Eddie into his office. Do you know what a placebo is, Eddie? I gotta go. It's water, Eddie. Water with a squirt of camphor to make it taste like medicine. Your doctor is weak and your mother is determined that you're ill. And you, my friend, are caught in the middle. Mr. Keen uses a balloon to demonstrate how Eddie's lungs are condensed by his uptight posture, and that may actually have been the cause of his breathing problems. He explains how a placebo works, and Eddie panics upon hearing this information and breaks an ice cream glass. Mr. Keen promises not to tell Eddie's mother that he broke the glass in exchange for keeping their conversation a secret. Quite the opposite of how it played out in the 2017 movie. They're placebos. What does placebo mean? Placebo means bullshit. You know what these are? They're gazebos! They're bullshit! After leaving Center Street Drug, Eddie runs into Costello Markets, and when he comes back out on the street, he encounters the bullies, and they are looking for revenge for what happened during the rock fights two weeks ago. <laughs> 
Eddie spots the bullies shortly after coming out of Costello Street Market. He tries to go back inside the store, but Henry grabs hold of him before he gets the chance. Patrick and Vic beat up on him, and Henry pins him to the ground and fills his mouth up with gravel. Before it can escalate any further, an adult who works at the market grabbed Henry, but instead of ending it then and there, Henry fights back and pushes him down before telling him to go back inside, a command that Mr. Goudreau actually obeys, and goes back to call the cops. Although he was unable to save Eddie, it did allow enough time for Eddie to run for it, and he's almost able to escape until he gets to the corner and collides with the little kid on a tricycle, Richard Cowan. He goes down, and Henry comes down hard on him and breaks his arm. When this happens, Eddie surprises Henry when he starts laughing. The reason for this once again goes back to Eddie's mother. She sheltered him all these years, been so overprotective of him that he's never broken anything before. Thinking back to that moment at the shoe store, he's never even felt real pain. And because of this, he's lived in fear of getting injured and built the idea of it up in his mind as the worst thing ever. So when he actually feels one of the most painful things happen, it's not as bad as he imagined it to be. And he starts laughing. The police officer, Mr. Nell, eventually found him, but not before Patrick spit in his face, which I imagine was the most traumatic part giving Eddie's hypochondriasis. In the ambulance, Eddie briefly sees Pennywise the Clown as the driver, but on second inspection realizes it's just some guy with a crew cut. As expected, Eddie's mom makes a huge scene at the hospital, acting like she knows better than all the doctors. And I think it's important to note how his broken arm was a blessing in disguise for him. He finally has the awakening about his mother that Mr. Keene had tried to give him earlier in the day, and suggests that she leave him alone while the doctors treat him. Sonia is shocked and sees this as an act of defiance. After visiting hours end, Eddie sees the sunset out his window, only it's a huge orange clown pom-pom button, just like the piranha he had seen in the Barrens. He falls asleep and dreams that his friends came to visit him in the hospital, but his mom told them off in the waiting room, telling them that Eddie doesn't want to be friends with them anymore. Pennywise is also sitting in the waiting room, but Eddie's the only one to notice him. It then displays several other forms, the last of which has Mrs. Kasparak's face, suggesting that she too may be a part of its influence. At the end of the dream, Eddie realizes he was unable to intervene because he was dead. He was a ghost. And that is a trick we call foreshadowing. Because Eddie dies. Not right now, but later. The dream sequence may have been an instance of shining for Eddie, because he was seeing a slightly different version of the real fight between his mom and his friends that occurred outside the hospital. Oh, I've heard of you, Miss Marsh. And I don't want a dirty girl like you touching my son. Eddie is upset with his mother for sending his friends away, so she changes tactics to get control back over her son. A study from the University College London, which sounds like a made-up university name that a high school dropout made to impress a girl at a party, but it's not, found that there are two ways that a parent tends to control their child. Behavioral control and psychological control. Child psychologist Nancy Darling describes a method of the latter. That the parent may use guilt induction, or make the child feel that they won't be loved if they don't do what the parents want. The core of psychological control is that it assaults the child's self. So Sonia starts crying to make Eddie feel bad, but he's able to see through her act. He calls her out on giving him the placebo asthma medication, and although he's not putting up with his mother's behavior anymore, his hypochondriasis is rooted too deep inside of him, and he uses the aspirator as soon as she leaves. He would go back to sleep, this time dreaming of a dark place where pumping machinery ran on and on, and he would soon discover its source. Eventually, the rest of the Losers Club returns to the hospital while Mrs. K isn't there, and they're able to see Eddie and sign his cast, and they describe the plan that they have to attack it. Eddie sees this event as something like a contract that they sign, and they would make good on that contract a couple of days after Eddie was released from the hospital by showing up at the house where Eddie had his first encounter with it, 29 Niebold Street. Eddie's aspirator goes around, and each member of the Losers Club takes one puff before going in and fighting Pennywise. Before going in, Eddie notices that the roses that the leper had touched during his first encounter had died. With all seven of them united, they're able to drive the monster down into the sewers. The last real day of Eddie's childhood came on August 10th, when he was in town with Richie and Stan on a strangely silent afternoon. They end up meeting up with everyone else, and Beverly warns them about her recent encounter with Henry Bowers, who had snapped and tried to kill her. Bill realizes that it is starting to control Henry, and the seven of them decide that now is the time to put an end to it. They drop Eddie's Parcheesi board in the clubhouse and head to the sewers, but Eddie has the feeling that they're being watched.
As the seven of them headed to the pumping station where they could enter the sewers, a rock came out of the bushes and hit Mike. It was Henry, Belch, and Victor. A storm bruised above them as they flee to the pumping station. Eddie is unable to climb the ladder on his own with his cast and rides on Bill's back. Eddie's bravery shines through here perhaps more than any other time. The boy, who earlier that summer had reservations about wading in the stream in the Barrens because of bacteria, was now trudging through the pipes flowing with literal sh** water, but his most heroic moment was yet to come. He was asked to lead the way because of his impeccable sense of direction, and as he did so, he sensed that it had been there. After traveling for a while, Eddie has the realization that they're now deeper than the sewer pipes should normally go, and we're now at the level of mine shafts or something. Just then, the group is attacked by it in the form of a giant eye with six tentacles that grabs Bill, Ben, Beverly, Richie, Stan, and Mike. Eddie may have been the one left unrestrained because it believed that he'd be the weakest with his broken arm, but the monster underestimates Eddie's strong imagination. Eddie believes that his aspirator contains battery acid and sprays it into the eye, causing immense pain to it, and follows that up with a little combo action by delivering a series of kicks to the eye, as if this were some kind of Legend of Zelda boss. He actually lost his shoe when it got stuck in the jelly of the eye, and hearing Eddie's aggressive screams as he saved his friends gave them the strength to get free. The eye disappeared. The next attack came from the giant bird, which swoops in and claws Eddie. This time, Stan is the one to save them, and they follow a pile of children's bones to make it to the lair of It. It is here that Bill has his interdimensional battle with It, and upon coming out, Eddie claims that he heard the monster dying as It retreated deeper into the sewers. They couldn't stick around to find out for sure. The chamber was flooding because of the storm, and the group counted on Eddie to get them out. But it was at this point that Eddie went from from being like Google Maps to being like Apple Maps and started to get lost. The group felt that they were drifting apart, an early symptom of the memory loss that would occur when they all left Derry. It was only Bev's love that could reunite them and make Eddie realize where he had turned wrong. Good word choice. Out of everyone, it was the easiest for Eddie to make the promise that they'd come back if it wasn't dead, because he believed the most that they had killed it. Unfortunately for Eddie, he was wrong. He stayed in Derry for at least a couple years, until he and his mother relocated to Queens, New York. When Eddie became a young man, he tried to escape his mother on three separate occasions, but I think it was because he didn't have the shared power of his friends in the Losers Club that he was unable to fight Sonia's psychological control like he did that day in the hospital, and he ended up returning home all three times. Mrs. Kasprak never Never wanted her son to go away to college or get married. Luckily for him, he had a natural talent for navigation and driving, leading him to eventually start his own limousine company, Royal Crest Limousine. Despite becoming successful, he continued to live with his mother. She continued to obsess over his health into his adulthood, and he continued to neglect her own, and by the age of 64, her weight exceeded 400 pounds, a size that even Ben Hanscom couldn't have dreamed of reaching. In the year 1980, Sonia Kasprak died of congestive heart failure. When Eddie goes in for his own checkup later that year, his doctor notices the green stick fracture and asked if he fell out of a tree as a kid. Eddie can't even remember how he had broken his arm back in the summer of 58. In 1981, he leaves home one more time, but ends up coming back with Myra, a fellow limo driver who he decided to make his wife. Just like his mother, she's a regular porker. What a porker. And Eddie thinks he may have married her because of her strong resemblance to Sonia. A resemblance so strong that they just decided to toss the wife character in the 1990 miniseries and have Eddie just still living with his mother. Eddie and his wife relocates to Long Island, New York. When Eddie gets the call from Mike Hanlon about the return of It in 1985, his wife uses the same psychological tactics that his mom would have used on him, making him feel guilty for leaving her. As the memories of his past trickle back, his asthma worsens as well, and he has a thought about coming back in a hearse. Eddie has one of his drivers take him to Penn Station, where he's able to catch a train to Cape Cod, where another limo company that he has an affiliation with lends him a car that he takes the rest of the way back to Derry, Maine, for the first time since his childhood. Eddie goes to a reunion lunch at the Chinese restaurant, where Mike catches the them all up on what has gone down in Derry. When they get their fortune cookies at the end of the meal, each cookie is manipulated by it, and the mutated cricket that comes out of Eddie's cookie reminds him of the crickets that he's never been able to exterminate from his basement. It's a bit different in the miniseries. Ah, that Eddie. So chucklicious. The losers plan to meet up again at the library that night, and in the meantime, Eddie gets off the bus at a random cross street of Kansas Street. He comes up on Tracker Bros Truck Depot, which was the prime spot for playing baseball as a kid, though Eddie would only shag balls because his mom believed he would get hurt if he played. While Eddie is alone here at the now defunct Truck Depot, he notices a concrete cylinder with the label Dairy Public Works, and remembers it as one of the entrances to the sewers. That's when he hears a voice inviting him to come play.
Eddie had only seen two balls hit over the fence at Tracker Bros. Both came off the bat of Belch Huggins. This was well before the baseballs were juiced in 2019, and in one of the two home runs, Belch actually knocked the cover off the ball. Just then, in 1985, a similar coverless ball flies back onto the field of play, as if it were some kind of Paul Goldschmidt home run at Wrigley Field. Man, I hate that guy. Strongly dislike, I mean, strongly dislike him. Then, Eddie sees Belch climb over the fence, though this was no ordinary Belch. He looked like the leper from 29 Nebels. The canvas squares that the kids used as bases rose from the ground and flew at Eddie. Tony Tracker, who would often watch the kids play back in 58, came out of the ground at home plate in what I can only imagine looked like a demented mega evolution of Diglett. Then, he sees a zombified version of his childhood crush, Greta Bowie, and she tells him that she had died in a car accident when she was 18, which may be it essentially telling Eddie that he'll never be with the girl he wants he'll be stuck with someone who is the equivalent of his mom forever. Eddie also sees Patrick Hockstetter's zombie as he ran for it, eventually collapsing once he was safe in McCarran Park. That night, they all meet at the library, and everyone brings booze. Eddie brings a gin and prune juice because he thinks it would be healthy. If you don't already know this, if something has alcohol, it does not qualify as healthy. Not even White Claw, and that stuff's more watered down than Paramore's last two albums. It uses its influence on the town to chase them out of the library, so they go back to the hotel, where Eddie sees his aspirator roll across the table by itself and notices balloons tied to the podium at the front desk, reading, Asthma medication gives you cancer, a likely taunt from It about the absence of Eddie's father. Everyone goes back to their rooms, and after some time, Eddie hears a knock on his door, and a voice tells him that it's the bellboy, with a message from his wife. As he's opening the door, he realizes that this was no bellboy. It was Henry Bowers, coming at him with a knife. Eddie closes the door on his arm, and the knife drops, but Henry's able to force his way in. Eddie smashes a bottle and stabs at Henry's eye as they tussle, and Henry shoves him back into a table, falling down and impaling himself on the bottle but Eddie's arm is once again broken in the process. Bill, Beverly, Richie, and Ben reconvene at Eddie's room. Henry's knife has somehow disappeared, and Henry was dead, but after finding out Mike was also attacked, they wanted to take no more chances. They decide to go to the Barrens and finish what they started 27 years ago. They piled into Eddie's limo, and when they arrived in the Barrens, the manhole cover was already open, waiting for them. The pumping machinery was off, just as it was that August day in 1958. And again, Eddie has to go down into the sewers on Bill's back. Eddie navigated them once more to reach the lair of the spider, or at least what they perceived to be the spider. Silly boy, you still think you can see me? <laughs> You'll never see me. You'll see only what your little mind can allow. Bill engages in the interdimensional mind battle with It, and Richie joins him. So Eddie, Beverly, and Ben are the only ones conscious in the real physical chamber. But Eddie can momentarily see the form of his mom's head take shape on the spider. He senses his friends are in danger, and tries to help like he did in 1958. Roll it. This is battery acid. Now you disappear. <laughs> In the novel, Eddie reaches into the spider's jaws and sprays the aspirator, and it bites down and rips Eddie's arm off with ease, leaving him to bleed out on the floor of the chamber. Richie, please. For the last time, don't call me that. Those were the last words that came out of Eddie's mouth. His vision about coming back to New York in a hearse, however, would not become a reality, as his friends were desperate to escape after defeating it. They were in bad condition and had to carry Bill's catatonic wife, who they rescued there. They left Eddie's body behind as the chamber began to flood once more, and felt that it was somehow fitting that this is where Eddie was supposed to be. Eddie Kasprak was never the most physically gifted member of the Losers Club, but it was his mental strength that allowed him to save his friends' lives as kids. But unfortunately for him, without their returned support for most of his life, he was unable able to break away from the psychosomatic stranglehold of his mother, even after her death, and he was unable to replicate his magic when he went up against it as an adult. To fully understand The Losers Club, you'll need to see these episodes of Horror History for my analysis. But first, make sure you're subscribed to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.